بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته I first want to express my sincere honor and pleasure to be here at the Faisal University this elegant university that has started only a few years ago and has so far earned for itself quite the name for a place in the education community and the place in Saudi Arabia and of course abroad. I want to thank my friend and my colleague Chris Dutter and uh, the other colleagues here at the face of whom I've worked with and actually learned from for many years. I'm very proud that Dr. Faisal and his likes are serving in this excellent university. I want to welcome the faculty members and the parents and the students, men and women. And uh, I'd like to first start by saying what an important moment to be commencing the second part of your life and talking to the students today of education by entering the university. When well chosen to come to the University of University, it is not the choice of the city university and the people who are managers with a vision and with hard work, but to be a university of excellence because it really carries the name of a great man. Every name of the University, great man is well known, of course, in Saudi Arabia, all over the world, and of course, particularly on the Islamic world. You cannot be a university called the Kifas University unless you live up to the name of Kifas, a man who is wildly the model, a role model for all of us in his vision, in his hard work, and his sacrifice for his country, for the ideals that he believed in, and of giving up his life, his own life, for the vision for these ideas. I do expect this university very much to take its place, inshallah, and it takes years for a university to take its place among the world's institutions, but I do expect this university to take its place in the place where it belongs, among the world organizations and universities. I have been put in this position, and at the face of what your own model, I think it's a time that I really have not deserved yet. I will put, be put in this position to speak to a very critical moment to people that are going into the next phase of their life. There are already uh, a few things for me to say, and I've chosen a few points that I think I should share with you today. They are not points to take from me as black and white, but maybe things to think about. First of all, uh, we all live in Saudi Arabia. So to start with, you need to begin to live in Saudi Arabia rather than just reside in Saudi Arabia. You need to understand the country. You need to understand its great history. You need to understand the way this country came together, its unity. And we need to understand the people of this country. We live in a country that is being endowed in every way. It's a beautiful country. Most importantly, it is the land of Hawaii. The land of Islam. What an honor to be really serving the Islamic cause and living in the land of Hawaii. Only a few hours, a few minutes away, you can be that can be given, and you can really feel the responsibility of the shoulders of people of this country. Second, you live in a country that comes from great history. It's not a country about oil wells, it's not a country about anything else. It is a country about also an incredible history, history of civilizations that have crisscrossed the land of Arabia, and therefore, this very important geographic location is really one of the most geographic locations on this planet. And we as Saudis have to understand that to be living in such a very critical location in the world, whether in the past or in the present or in the future, that concerns you more. 
If you have a great responsibility to really understand the unity of this country and how to make the safety that brought us together, that built these great institutions, that has created a oasis and an oasis of stability in the midst of chaos in our part of the world. I've always said that we as Saudis are genetically programmed, more or less, to be living in a very critical part of the world. A very important part in terms of religion, culture, civilization, interaction, and also in terms of economic weight. Of course, we live in the largest oil producing country in the world. We are very glad to have all that oil. I've been asked questions before, almost like a stigma. You know, you have so much oil, what are you going to do with it? And it's almost like talking to us like if we have oil, it means we have less. But we're very proud that we have a lot of oil, and we wish we had a lot more of it. Because we have a lot more to do, and want to do a lot more in our future. You just have to get into your car, and like me, come in a small plane and fly all over the country like the way I like to see my country. And you see the miracle that has happened in this bad desert land. Many other countries in Hawaii have had greater wealth than South Arabia. And have destroyed those beautiful and great countries because those countries did not start with a vision or start with an idea that unifies their countries, their peoples, and brings them together. So genetically, we are programmed to be living in a very, if you like, using more than one term, a hot zone. A country that sits in the middle of civilizations, of trade routes throughout its history, a resolution that is touring the United States and opening in Texas on the 18th of December, if any of you is near that place, has been signed the world with more than 2 million visitors that have really completely been stunned by the history of this country and the civilizations that have spent thousands of years discussing Arabia, trading, building economic powers, and so on. So we are the custodians of a great history, as we are, of course, the custodians of the two world economics, and, of course, the custodians of the national unity it is far beyond any experience the modern world has ever seen. It's not a simple task to invite Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, into a country and into a people. Unifying the hearts of people is much more than unifying the borders and the small towns and villages. Many countries have tried by force, by different means, to unify small towns and villages to the experience of the Soviet Union. As soon as the idea of the Soviet Union fell apart, those countries fragmented and basically went their way. The Saudi Arabia was founded about 300 years ago. It's not a new country. It has persistently come back to unify itself three times. We are living in the third and the most prosperous and stable Saudi Arabia today. And I say to the people of Saudi Arabia, men and women, that not only you're getting an education, but you should really concentrate on understanding your country, its presence, its history, and where it's going. There's a great need for the young people of Saudi Arabia to really play a very active role building this country and maintain its prosperity and stability. Not a very easy thing for Saudi Arabia to stay and to land prosperous and stable. No country in this region of being full size weight. Your country is a heavyweight country. Your country is a real country. It's a country of people who walk the streets, who go to the towns and villages, you enjoy the multi people cultures, you meet people who come from different backgrounds, different accents, and you understand the story of Saudi Arabia, I think, mostly outside of Saudi Arabia, 
outside of the big cities that you do in the big cities. And you understand why this country came together, why it stayed there, Alhamdulillah, and that also why it will continue to be a prosperous unified nation. This can't happen with young people who are entering the universities, or even graduating from the universities, who really don't understand the depth, in depth, the national history, the history of the national unification. And to reach this point, the national unification did not really happen as you may imagine. And I have heard from some Saudi colleagues and friends through armies moving around the country and basically subduing people into submission. It really happened from within. I could probably go across the room and ask people to stand up. And probably with my limited knowledge, I'd like to say, of the history of this country, is probably point out your families and their contribution, or even your towns and villages, and their contribution to the unity and building of Saudi Arabia. So what I'm asking you today in today's view is to really enter into this phase of your life thinking, how can I learn, how can I prepare myself to continue doing what my forefathers, my parents, my grandparents have done to bring this fantastic country to this very important point in its history. We are going to face, and this is again genetically something we're used to, I remember my lifetime, then the members of the guys of my age remember that we never had a year where we didn't have to deal with problems. External pressures and internal uh, usual pains of change, pains of development. But if you look really back, you understand that this country has really managed, and I say country, I don't say, I don't say government, I don't say anything else, I say country as a people, have worked together to manage the pains of change and to actually change. You really have to give, give great credit to this country, its leadership, its people, for managing incredible change and moving these communities, whether it's desert communities, whether it's oases, coastal communities, mountain communities, into a mosaic that basically uh, looked at from afar would look really uh, impossible to come together if you have not really understood the history of Saudi Arabia. Arabia has never been unified in this history, except two times. With the days of the Prophet Sallallahu and during the early Saudi states, it started in 1745. A lot of sacrifice, a lot of great people, your own ancestors, have worked hard to back it out with invasions and with external forces to continue to bring this unity together. We, as the generation that lives in this country today, and this young generation that will continue to carry the torch, has to really think, am I here at this university to get a degree and get a job? Or am I here at this university, of course, to get a degree that will allow me to, be, to begin a learning process and have to serve my country? The wonderful lady who preceded me, who presented me, uh, said something about my accomplishments and so on. I really don't see, spoke about myself, not speaking, that I have really not begun all the years have been serving and trying to serve my country, whether it's in the military, whether it's in the law form, whether it's in other uh, non-profit organizations, or my government work, which takes up a lot of time and pressure, yes and no. I really don't think, every time I think of my country, how great this country is, and how fantastic of an accomplishment this is for the people of South Arabia, that I have done enough for my country. And this country is changing. But it's not changing because it's following a fashionable direction for change. People have tried out for and continue to follow fashion in terms of political ideals, philosophies, social change. These bubbles have burst, and many countries are feeling the problems that came with change that has not been managed well and that not have come gradually.
idly, holding hold hands. The people of Saudi Arabia are not all living in Riyadh, are living in Jeddah. The people of Saudi Arabia are living in small towns and villages. They have ideals, they have values, wonderful values that have really made up this country. And going forward, this country has no place to go. We continue to be a modern country, a prosperous country, breaking, if you like, using a wide stir, the South Barrier in development and building. And of course, if you go around your country today, you understand there is not a larger place anywhere in the Middle East that a country has ever been living like this country is living today. I don't mean just physically, the infrastructure, but I mean also socially, politically, and of course, the type of people how they're changing, especially the young people of Saudi Arabia. So, if you see the vision of the future, that we want Saudi Arabia to be, of course, a unified, prosperous, and beautiful country to live in. I want my children, their children, and children to continue enjoying living in this country and to continue solving the problems it goes through, continue contributing to social change, continue, continue to bring people together to be convinced of going to the next level and the next level and the next level. The change could never happen with single pressure. People of Saudi Arabia are not used to really. The bubbles between one now and then, the pressure change. We've had those before in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. And now we have the value of change that happens with people on board. I do this in my organization, the professor knows that the Saudi Christian Cultural Activities is really a groundbreaking organization, a large organization, a state on itself to partner. To partner with local communities, to partner with other government organizations. My passion is really that the commission is going to the small towns and villages of Saudi Arabia and partnering, bringing people together, taking them along, being patient until they come to the middle where we want them to be, developing their communities and restoring and uh, developing their heritage areas and believing in what they need to do. So I I'd like to thank you today for giving this opportunity to talk to you. I really wish you, inshallah, and pray for you to have the best of luck. And I always look at the young people of Saudi Arabia, not just as the home of the future, but uh, as people that are much smarter than we were. We were at your age, much more educated, much more connected. I'm very connected in every way I can. And, and this connectivity has to translate into something positive, rather than just connectivity for connectivity sake. We live in a different age, so uh, I look forward to the Infex University to deliver generation after generation of young people, Saudis or otherwise, who can really fit into the new age, the age where we can balance between our values and our future, balance between our environments and the environments, and a balance between how we live in our country and the difference between living in Saudi Arabia and how that can coincide with living in other countries, where we live in our own country. So I wish you all the inshallah, the tawfiq, fortune, good fortune, and I wish you uh, happy university I really want you to think that do not miss these fantastic years. These are the best years of your life. I wish I could close my eyes and go back to school. Uh, maybe I, I wish I'd go back to school not to have to study. But college years are the best years of your life. Keep an open mind and uh, start today putting blocks of things that you can be proud of when you were about 40. And a lot of people come to the commission asking for jobs. And one time, I want to tell you the story. One time, uh, a gentleman came with his son. And he said, my son just finished high school, and he wants a job. I said, what's his problem? He said, oh, he doesn't wake up early in the morning. He said, I said, you're in the wrong place. The CTA, 
we actually started at 7, 7.30 in the morning and go on. So he is not enthusiastic. She said, well, it's from my hand to your hand. So I sat with the gentleman. I said to his father to, if possible, to leave the room. And we sat together and I said to him, and I have never seen him before. He comes from a very area. And I said to him, I want you to close your eyes. And I don't know what he thought I was going to do. Punch him in the face or and he said, what do you mean? I said, I just want you to close your eyes. And I said to him, uh, he did close his eyes. Very clearly, he was very reluctant. and he keeps opening one eye, he closed another. And I said, think of yourself as 40 years old, with five children, four children. I said to him, a man is going to be a problem, because yesterday I'm looking for somebody who's upstanding, and who's working, and who can deliver a family, and can take care of a family. So he said, you'll have a problem first of all, find your wife. The second, think of your 40 and your children are in school and they start not wanting to go to school. They start wanting to sleep and not want to go to school. What would you tell your child? Paul said, you can't tell them I you know, had the same experience and basically did the same thing you did. And I kept talking to him about imagining life when he's 40. 40 is just enough that I came up with. And he opened his eyes and said, what do you want me to do? I said, I want to go to the university, Fitch University. The government gives you a salary, and what do you need money for? He said, give me time to think. His father came to me three years ago. The boy finished university from King's College University. He went to scholarship. He did not finish his master's degree in engineering. And he's coming back to work in Saudi Arabia. And these are the stories, and this is the wonderful. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes now, but I think you go home today. Try to get away from your iPad and me iPad and all that stuff. And you know, Instagram and Twitter and stuff. And basically close your eyes by lying in them and say, what do I want to look back at when I'm at that age? Of course, somebody or maybe dependents, but don't even think of the prospect of, of being 40 years old. But think of that prospect. This man today is an environment of example of hard work and I'm very proud. And I have my sister and my family member and also a Saudi citizen who really shows the face of Saudi women who can have a family, manage a family, keep, keep a husband in line, have children and still continue to the country. Thank you very much.